Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey, fellas. Let's do it. Let's continue. I did a little refresher, um, so previous, just to kind of gain my bearings. Let's go. I, I was talking about at the end of the last video how it's crazy how this this new religion is is and these seemingly ragtag group of of Arab um, armies are are defeating these two large empires in the Sassanid and Byzantines. Very impressive. Um, and uh, I'm ready to go. All right, let's go. If you're not ready to learn about the spread of Islam, there's the door. You're in the wrong class. Home is down the hall. Make me... Samosa. Right? Those are those, like, Indian potato pancake things? Those are good. All right, let's go. Romans at the Yellow Meadow, otherwise known as Major Safar, the road was clear to Damascus. Not pancake, dumpling. Let's go. When the invading Arabs neared the city, the Muslim commander realized that his forces were not numerous enough to encircle it entirely. Instead, each of the Muslim sub-commanders stationed their contingents outside of the city's various gates, fully blockading the crucial thoroughfares by August 21st, with a total of around 20,000 soldiers, 16,000 infantry, and 4,000 mobile guard cavalry. Damascus immediately began starving due to the lack of supplies and unpreparedness for a siege, while the Muslims were well supplied due to their domination of the fertile and productive local countryside. As the swift Arab light horsemen were relatively useless in a siege, Khalid ibn al-Walid sent a few hundred of them to the Eagle's Pass to the north in order to act as scouts. Here they watched for any Byzantine relief force aiming to pass through this choke point. The other half stayed near the city as a reserve, Smart. ready to help repel any sortie made by the Romans. In Antioch, the Roman Emperor learned of the siege and sent a 12,000 strong relief force, along with plentiful supplies, to help Damascus on September 9th. When this force reached the narrow pass where the Muslim scouts were stationed, they pushed the cavalry back. One of these scouts managed to send notice to Al-Walid, and he, gambling that repelling the relief attempt was more important than maintaining too tight a blockade, took the remaining cavalry at night to the Eagle Pass, where he managed to rout the Romans. Wow! Despite their apparent success, the besieging Arab forces were now stretched thin by Khalid's withdrawal. Historians believe that if the garrison's general Thomas had chosen to launch a sortie at this point, the Byzantines could have broken the siege, but they did not and therefore lost the opportunity. It seems that Al-Walid realized he had put the siege in danger with his gamble, and he hurriedly returned to Damascus after he attained victory at the Eagle's Pass. As the garrison and Thomas realized that no relief was coming, Morale among the defenders of Damascus became weaker and weaker. That? It was clear action would be needed. So, the Emperor's son-in-law decided to launch a counter-offensive of his own. For this first attack, Thomas decided to concentrate on one specific section of the city, drawing men together from all sectors of the city towards the Gate of Thomas, where he was faced by around 5,000 soldiers under Shurabil. Guys, I'm still trying to wrap my head around how... How this is happening uh so sure they could have had the the uh, muslim military leaders are have proven themselves i i have no doubt that they know what they're doing but how are they never losing how are they there must be a loss i, I mean what was it just like a perfect time to strike like the byzantines and the sassanids are Are they distracted? How are they losing so badly to to this new army? I uh, I I was reading your comments. A lot of you guys did explain how you know there's religious fervor involved, and and you know they're they're not. Some of these commanders are brilliant. I understand that stuff, but it just still doesn't seem to explain the ease that they're going through this. 
After the defending soldiers gathered in the area, the Byzantine commander began his sortie by ordering his archers to rain down a constant stream of arrows against their enemy, to which the Arabs responded accordingly. Using the cover granted by the Roman missile units, the infantry rushed through the Gate of Thomas and fanned out into battle formation, with Thomas himself leading the assault. During the subsequent skirmish, it is reported that Thomas both broke through a section of the Muslim line and almost killed Shurabil, but he was then shot in the eye by the widow of a slain Arab soldier. Despite some level of success, the sortie had failed to break the siege, and the Byzantine forces retreated into the city. As they did, it is said that the injured Roman leader swore to take a thousand eyes in return for his own. That night, another plan to break the siege was devised by the defenders. As a constant, you're gonna take out the eyes of a thousand people because you got your traded attack on one of the gates had failed, Thomas would this time launch simultaneous strikes from four of the gates. Two large forces were gathered, at the eastern gate where Khalid was in command, and at the gate of Thomas, where the main attack against exhausted enemy units would be undertaken. The other forces at the small gate and the Jabir gate were designed to pin their besiegers in place. As Thomas sounded the attack, a grinding battle took place at the Jabiyah Gate, with both sides suffering many losses. After a while of this slaughter, Abu Ubaidah and his forces at this gate managed to doggedly repulse the Byzantine assault, driving them back into the city. Let me talk about the religious fervor point. I don't think that's that's not. I, I don't. I, I think that's a fine point to say religious fervor would would aid would make your soldiers more more focused on, on the goal and not think so much about their worldly possessions that they might be losing and and it's more of a holier kind of purpose but these are people who are also fighting for their lives now and so they're going to have equal if not more amount of fervor just fighting for their their life so it must be pretty tough fighting here. The situation was far more serious at the Eastern Gate, where the Byzantines had a larger force. This larger contingent of defenders managed to break the Arab infantry and drive them back, but Khalid himself then arrived with 400 elite mobile guard cavalry and with them struck the Roman flank. This weakened the sortie irreversibly and the defenders were slowly driven back inside the gates. Once again, however, the worst of the fighting occurred at the Gate of Thomas. Here, the Byzantine forces were led by the one-eyed Thomas himself, and after intense fighting, there was still no weakness in the Muslim ranks. At this point, the Roman commander seems to have realized there was no point in continuing the grinding melee, and commanded a slow, steady withdrawal. All the while, the Arab archers continually showered his men with arrows. This was the last effort by Thomas to break the Muslim siege, and it had failed with the loss of thousands of men. With this Guys, I wonder what the number one fatal blow was on the battlefield at this point. Do you think it was you were most likely to get killed by a cavalry charge or an arrow or a spear or whatnot? Defeat, he could no longer afford any more attempts at a breakout. A Greek in Damascus, known as Jonah the Lover in Arab sources, climbed over the wall and informed Khalid that on the night of the 18th of September, there would be a Christian religious ceremony which would leave the walls relatively unguarded. He supposedly betrayed his city because his marriage to his fiancée had been interrupted by the siege. Is this a trap? And frustrated, asked for the Muslim's help in obtaining said bride. This man soon converted to Islam but the details are incredibly vague. Sorry, is this going to be a double-double cross, or is that...? Whatever the case, details of the opportunity led Khalid to borrow ladders from a local monastery and to purchase ropes in order to form an assault party. That night, a 100-strong contingent, led by the Muslim general himself, climbed the walls, dropped into the city and killed the guards at the eastern gate. 
Then the attackers flung open the gate and let the remainder of the Muslim forces at the eastern gate inside the city. The other Byzantine detachments stationed elsewhere were unaware of this surprising development and, instead of helping, stayed at their posts. At the same time, Khalid began to fight his way towards the center of the city. Now attempting to save the city for a final time, Thomas sent envoys to Abu Ubaidah at the western Jabiya gate, offering surrender and a payment of the jizya in exchange for a capitulation by terms. This was given by the supposedly peace-loving Abu Ubaidah. However, Khalid, who had finished slaughtering his way to the center of the city, was furious that a surrender had been allowed even though the city had technically been taken by storm. Nevertheless, the many Muslim unit commanders agreed that a surrender would be honored. Khalid reluctantly accepted this judgment. So what would be the difference in outcome other than just... So it, what did they give up there? Is it just because of the way it finished? You'd rather it be written down in history as a conquering rather than a surrender? Or is there some... You know, like, how would it have been different if it was conquered by siege? The fall of Damascus was a shock for the Byzantines as they probably thought that the Muslim attack on the region was a massive raid and not a full-on invasion. Syria and Egypt were the most important provinces of the empire, and the fall of the former would mean that the land route to the latter was cut, and it was now also vulnerable to being occupied. Emperor Heraclius couldn't allow that, so he started sending orders to the provinces in order to bring in more reinforcements to the region. Simultaneously, the political situation in the Caliphate had also changed, as Caliph Abu Bakr passed away in late August of that year and was replaced by Umar. The new Caliph immediately started implementing administrational and military reforms, creating new administrative positions in the provinces and changing the formation of the army from the one created on the tribal principle to a more centralized one. Immediately after his ascension, Umar sent a letter to the army, relieving Khalid of his post and appointing Abu Ubaidah in his place. We don't know if this was part of the reforms or hey, as some sort. Of Abu Bakr was pretty good, guys. Um, again, it's just I'm, Im I guess impressed would be the word after watching all of these history videos. This has seemingly been one of the easier roads so far in terms of conquering um I, there must be some setbacks you know nothing is ever perfect let's see what happens Horses claim it happens due to the previous animosity between the new caliph and the general in any case it seems that before the messengers could reach damascus the three-day peace the muslims promised thomas had passed and khalid alongside five thousand cavalry guided by Jonah, started pursuing the Romans. Thomas had around 10,000 people with him, both soldiers and citizens of Damascus, but instead of finding refuge in one of the nearby towns, this group was heading towards Antioch, and that allowed the Arab cavalry to catch up to them to the south of Latakia sometime in late September. The details of the engagement, now known as the Battle of Maraj al dabaj are scarce, but according to the Muslim sources, a cavalry detachment of a few hundred caught up and took position to the south of Thomas. The Romans immediately noticed them, deciding that they would be able to defeat this small group with ease. Not to the surprise of the them. Romans, as soon as the Arab cavalry and Roman infantry started fighting, another group of Khalid's horsemen appeared to the east. Although the Romans had thousands of refugees in Another their midst, the west. they still outnumbered the Muslims, and a portion of their infantry formed up to face the new threat. However, a half hour after the battle was joined here, a third group of Arab cavalry started charging from the north, and the Romans barely got Give into a, a defensive formation in time to prevent it from breaking through. Thomas's situation was becoming dangerous, as the route to Damascus was now cut off. I can see a similarity between the Mongols 
or I shouldn't even bring up the Mongols. Uh, the only similarity I'm talking about is, is on horseback. It seems that the Muslim armies are very much cavalry armies, and so that that seems to be their major advantage. But the Romans were still fighting on an equal footing, and the battle raged on three sides. An hour later, Khalid himself appeared to the west with the largest part of his army and charged the Romans. Despite the fact that Thomas managed to get a few units to this front, they were swept aside almost immediately, and the Arab cavalry was now deep inside the Roman formation. Thomas was soon killed. The Roman resistance continued. They just can't, they're too fast. You can't, you can't do anything. Some time, but was broken within an hour. Some soldiers and refugees managed to slip away to the north, but the majority of the Romans were either killed or captured. Khalid lost just a few hundred troops. Immediately afterwards, the Arabs headed to Damascus and reached it in early October. Apparently, Abu Ubaidah already received the messenger from the Caliph and informed Khalid of his demotion. According to sources, the latter accepted it without much protest, but it did change the flow of the Caliphate's expansion in the region. Abu Ubaidah was much doing slower so well. and more deliberate than Khalid. Umar preferred a more hands-on approach to the armies, often issuing orders after every engagement, which slowed down the campaigns due to the distance to Medina. He even placed informers in the army, which made Abu Ubaidah even more careful in his decisions. At the same time, the Muslims received some reinforcements, bringing the total number of their troops to 30,000. However, that wasn't the only change in command made by Umar, which brings us back to Iraq, where Khalid left Muthana in charge of a 9,000-strong army in 634. For the next few months, Muthana, whose numbers weren't enough to conquer any more lands, implemented the tactic of raids in order to keep the superior Sassanid forces at bay. The details are lost to time, but the Sassanids, who were used to fighting in pitched battles, were having a difficult time containing the raids, and one of them even reached Babylon. Yeah, it just seems like it's the Muslim armies are such a curveball to uh, the Byzantines and the Sassanids who are used to these more formal... Let me know if I'm wrong anyway. Uh, always, guys. Let me know if I'm wrong. I Sometimes I, I state my things maybe with more assurance than, than I should. I am still learning. But it, it just seems like they weren't used to this kind of tactic of quick cavalry raids and and seemingly overwhelming numbers, which is another surprising thing since I wouldn't think that the Arabian Peninsula would have a lot of people on it. As much in density as the other places, just because of the arid climate, right? The best Sassanid commander, Rostam, who basically controlled the court of the 10-year-old Shah Yazdegerd, was reluctant to leave the capital, worried that it might incite another revolt. But Mathana's raids were too dangerous, so the general decided to take command over the forces in Iraq and marched south supported by the Sassanid generals Baman, Jaban, and Nasi, and the Armenian noble Jalinus. Even before this multi-pronged counterattack began, Muthana knew that he needed reinforcements and sent a messenger to the capital. By August, this messenger was in Medina, just in time for the ascension of Umar. The new caliph appointed Abu Ubaid, not to be confused with Abu Ubaidah, to command in Iraq and gave him 6,000 or so troops to reinforce Muthana. The latter was now informed of the Sassanid counterattack, and when Jaban got close to al Hira in late September, the Arab commander abandoned it, retreating to Kafan. By early October, Abu Ubaid joined him, bringing the total strength of the Caliphate's force to more than 15,000, a similar number to that commanded by Jaban, who crossed the Euphrates and was now at Namur. Think about how many battles have happened over history prior to even prior to this, much prior to this, ju just in this area. The details of the battle Namurik. at Namurik are not clear, but it seems that Jaban suffered a minor defeat and was forced to retreat beyond the river. 
Abu Ubaid decided to fight the approaching Sassanid armies in detail, and marched north towards Kaskar, hoping to defeat the smaller army under Nasi and knock him out. Although the Muslims won again, the Persian army managed to retreat mostly intact, and Abu Ubaid, who knew that Jalinus might cut his retreat to al Hira, moved his army double time to prevent this from happening. Indeed, the army of the Caliphate reached the city before Jalinus blocked them. The closest Sassanid armies to al Hira. See, but they're not just a ragtag group of, 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 of Muslims. Again, I, they, are, they are Muslim, but it's just so early on in the religion that you, you can't rely on this, like, century-old fervor around some religion that, that made them follow you. It's so many impressive things leading, leading to this. Yeah, I, I'm not sure about the status of the Sassanids and Byzantines exactly right before this. I, I don't know how ready they were to fight, but I can't just rely on, on them being you know, these, these horse raiders, horseback raiders, because they obviously are making great decisions. And not just like one of their star, um, not just Muhammad or, or Abu Bakr, it, many of them are, are, seem to really know what they're doing on the battlefield, so. The city before Jalinus blocked them. The closest Sassanid armies to al Hira were those of Jalinus and Bahman. A letter from Rostam ordered them to unite their troops, cross the Euphrates, and attack the city. In late October of 634, their united armies, numbering around 20,000, attempted to force oh. the river near Kufa, but Abu Ubaid and his 15,000 were able to halt this crossing. For some time, the armies stood in front of each other screaming insults, until a Sassanid emissary approached Abu Ubaid with Bahman's message. Either you cross over to our side and we shall let you, or we shall cross over to your side and you must let us. Yeah. Although his officers protested it, Abu Ubaid was eager to cross and fight in a pitched battle, so he ordered his army to do that. Seeing this, Bahman repositioned his troops slightly to the north, allowing the Muslims to move across and form up. Stuff's about to get real, okay. Unlike previous battles, the Persians had a dozen or so elephants, and they were placed in the vanguard with heavy cavalry between them and the infantry in the second echelon. Abu Ubaid's army crossed the river in two hours and started to get into formation once again with horsemen in front and the footmen in the second Did line. Did the Sassanids let them? Bahman continued to wait, and it was Abu Ubaid who gave the order to his soldiers to attack. The Arab cavalry galloped forward, but their horses were scared of the elephants, probably seeing them for the first time, and the charge stopped before it managed to reach the Sassanid lines. Wow. In response... That's so great, I've always been wondering, okay... How much can elephants really do on a battlefield? They're so... I was thinking about this with Hannibal. They're so... They're such a large target, and... But they, they clearly just have an intimidation factor that is more powerful than what they can really do to hurt you. Of course, an elephant can kill you very easily, but it just seems like it messes up cavalry charges, and it freaks horses out, and men... Bahman moved his archers to the front and commanded them to shoot at the retreating Arabs. The volleys killed and wounded many, and when the leaders of the army of the Caliphate attempted to move their archers forward to start skirmishing, the whole Arab line became chaotic and disjointed. Honestly, it just sh finally it shows they're human, finally messing something up. The Persian commander used that and directed his cavalry and elephants to attack. While the cavalry was mostly stopped, the elephants easily created wedges everywhere they struck. The Arab army was slowly but surely forced back. The presence of the elephants was panicking the horses, so in order to stabilize the front, Abu Ubaid commanded his horsemen to dismount. He led a group of warriors himself, killing a few elephants and their entourages. Wow. However, another elephant was sent towards the Arab leader, and soon he was killed by the beast. Whoa. Many other Muslim leaders were killed, and their army started fleeing in chaos, and the Sassanids started chasing them. 
Muthanna was one of the last remaining commanders, and he achieved some degree of discipline and organization at the crossing, leading the rearguard and allowing the remainder of the army to retreat. He was badly wounded during the fight, but his actions saved thousands. The Battle hey, of the Bridge. Honestly, it, the fact that they lost right there, it makes me kind of want to root for them more now because it was just win, 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 win. You got a loss under your belt now, and now take it back and, and learn. It was the first battle the Persians won in this war. More than 10,000 Muslims lay dead, while the Sassanid casualties were around 2,000. Over the following weeks, Bahman didn't pursue Muthana, who withdrew to Ulais and returned to Tessiphon. Can't win them Some all, boys. sources claim that there was another rebellion against Rostam, others that Bahman was sent to deal with the Turkic raiders. The sources are also conflicted on the events that happened in Iraq later in 634 and then in 635, with some chronicles asserting that Muthanna's army deserted and he abandoned all the previous conquests, and others stating that the Sassanids sent a large army under Miran and it was decisively defeated at Buweib in April of 635. In any case, this lull in action allows us to return to the Levant. The Muslim army was getting used to the new command structure. Guys, I think that's a good time to stop. Awesome. Hey, they got one loss under their belt. Not bad. It's still amazing how fast they're conquering these two empires or defeating these two empires in battles. I will get back to this one soon. I won't spread it out as much. I'll get back to it tomorrow. All right. I won't spread it out as much as I have been. And uh, I'll see you guys next time. All right. It's been fun. See ya.